Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the session about uh, evalu evaluation of Visual Studio Code Java ecosystem. Um, my name is Adi Polak, and I'm with Microsoft. And it's a pleasure to be here in DevX Poland and to see old friends and new friends. Um, it's great to talk to you about everything that Microsoft has been doing for the Java community, uh, for Spring developers, for Spring, uh, working with Fivotel, IBM, and much more companies. And today we're going to focus on VS Code and all the great plugins that VS Code brings to the Java community. And so let's start and take a journey of all the great tools we have. And also, at the end, we would like to get your feedback on what you would like to see in VS Code, because it's mostly a community-based feature that we're working on constantly. So the landscape of Java on the cloud is pretty massive. It goes all the way from low-level Linux distributions to cloud automations to Kubernetes and containers. Everything supports Java to Azure services, to the tools we're working with, to the frameworks, to the plugins. Everything in, uh, in Azure, uh, all the services are now supporting Java as well, which is a great advantage for us. On Microsoft Azure, over 50% of the workloads are Linux-based. That's uh, a thing we already know and we already established a while ago. But today, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about VS Code and why you should use VS Code and for what purpose you should use VS Code. So before we talk about VS Code, we need to understand what are editors. So editors is basically a tool for us to write text. It can be Java-based multi-platform like Jedit. It can be TextPad that only used on um, only available for Windows machines. It could be Sublime, where you can use it in any OS that you want, like Windows, Mac, Linux. And it can be Atom Editor as well, which is also available with, on Windows, Mac, and Linux. But why Visual Studio? That's the big question. I mean, we have so many good IDEs, and Visual Studio is not an IDE. So what is a text editor, what it has? A text editor is keyboard-centric. It's lightweight. It doesn't have a lot of features. It mostly helps us to work with files and folders. And the main reason a lot of people use it because it's polyglot. And polyglot means we can develop in a lot of different programming language in the same editor without switching screens, without switching tools. And what IDE gives us? IDE gives us the build system. It's project uh, also integrated build inside, has the project system, so gives us the ability to debug, Give us the ability to use template, wizards, all this kind of integration, designers. So where is Visual Studio stands? Visual Studio is somewhere in the middle, between text editors and IDEs. Visual Studio is also keyboard-centric. It's also lightweight and fast. When you download Visual Studio, you don't get all the plugins built in. You can pick which plugin you would like to download to make sure your workspace is aligned to your work. It's also polyglot. You can develop in JavaScript, and you can develop in Java in the same place. You can move from creating your scripts in Python and then back to the Java development that you do. There's an interesting thing with code understanding behind it, and it also allows us to debug. So like we said, Visual Studio is a lightweight editor. We can configure it to our purpose. We can configure it from the DevOps perspective. We can configure it from language development perspective. We can configure it to the tools we want to work with. It works on all platforms. So we, have, we can use it on Windows, on Mac, on Linux. It's free and open source. It's base, but is, uh, supported by the community. The community adds a lot of uh, interesting plugins, a lot of interesting features. And it works for any language and any framework. And during the survey of 2019, Visual Studio Code was uh, chosen to be the most popular development environment. And we believe one of the reasons for that is because it's polyglot. And the world is changing. Uh, we do see a lot of developers that, doing, that 
working with more than one uh, language programming. We do see a lot of change going that way. It's not only uh, writing Java, it's writing Java, oh, and I need a little bit of scripting in Python, or I need a little bit of adding things in Rust, or I need a little bit of changes in JavaScript files that I'm working on, and I don't want to change my screen. So this is the reason we, we believe that uh, Visual Studio Code become the most popular developer environment of 2019, according to Stack Overflow. Visual Studio Code supports hundreds of programming language. Everything you want, from Rust to Ruby to PHP to Java to Python, every programming language that exists can be supported by Visual Studio Code. But how does it work? What does it mean it's supported? How can we enable it to support so many languages? So Microsoft created that thing called Language Server Protocol. And actually, the language server protocol that it does, it's actually a, a protocol that communicates between the developer tool and the language server. When the language server provides us uh, features like autocomplete of the language itself, go to definition by the language itself, and all reference and the like that we need to find. And, uh, and on the other side, we have the developer tool, uh, which is the one that speaks with the server this is, this is our client, and our client speaks with the server and asks it for things that it needs according to the language that the, that the developer is now using. So basically, the language service protocol was created by Microsoft to define the common languages for programming language to analyze uh, to, uh, analyzer to speak together. And today, a lot of companies use it and also support it. It's open source. Um, it's been supported by CodeNV. Red Hat, Source Graph, and it's actually growing pretty rapidly. And also, uh, it's been used by Eclipse as well. You can see it under, uh, under the hood of Eclipse. Um, so there's a lot of details, and it's always uh, evolving, and always, we always add languages, and we always add more and more support. And then, in 2016, a group of people gathered together and said, whoa, you know, we have this uh, great languages server protocol. Why should we, why we don't have any Java language server to implement that protocol? So a group of people from Red Hat, IBM, CodeNVy, and Microsoft uh, collaborate together and created that, that server over an hackathon uh, in Switzerland. And it was very successful. And actually, um, it's now uh, continued to being supported by Red Hat. So Java support is wide. There's a lot of companies providing and giving back to the VS Code ecosystem. Not only Microsoft doing it, also Red Hat, Pivotal, and open source community are constantly adding more and more plugins. At the moment, we see more than 50 million downloads of Java plugin of the VS Code. That's a fifth time fifth uh, time growth than three years ago, which is pretty amazing. That means that it's really been that people are really using it, and it also means that people are a, a little bit leaning towards doing polyglot and not only developing in one language. So more developers are joining the community, and when we look at the JetBrains survey that comes up every year we finally see that in 2018, people are talking about Visual Studio Code. They're mentioning it as ID or editor that they use the most, which is pretty interesting because it's 2017, no one was talking about it. But since then, a lot of been, has, has been changed and it's, been, it's seen a lot of growth. So how do you get started? We created that thing, we call it the packs of plugins. What we didn't have in the past, now we finally have it, pack of plugins, where you can say, okay, I would like the Java extension pack, which also includes inside the server that we talked about, the language server that we need, the debugger, unit tests and tests, to run, uh, plugins to run it, Maven dependency, and a lot of other tools that you can use to start your first app. And actually, we added a little bit more onto it and released it a few days ago. 
And that's, uh, uh, that's uh, an app that you can download. And it's actually auto-detect the environment where it downloaded at. And then it, uh, you, it asks you what you want to install. So it can detect if there's already Java on your device. Uh, it's asking you what kind of Java, what version do you want to install. It checks if you have VS Code. If you don't have VS Code, it asks you, would you like to download VS Code? And then it adds all the Java extensions that you need to get started. And it's also configured all the home path and all this kind of stuff that you need so you can hit the ground running in a matter of minutes. So you don't need any more to deal with all the Java configuration that you need to do behind the scene. You just download it. It detects the environment you're at. You press a few clicks, and it installs everything you need there. So that's really awesome. That's a great improvement. And that's something um, that the community asked us to create, because we noticed, especially with students, that they're having a lot of hard time configuring the environment where they, uh, where they want to run their Java code. And they spend a lot of time just configuring it. So now um, they have this tool, and they just need to download it and run it, and that's it. So let's look a little bit about how, how it looks like. So now I already have Java installed. So the first thing I see is the Java overview when I open the VS Code. So it tells me, what do you want to start doing? Do you want a Maven project? Do you want some documentation? Do you, would you like some key bindings? And it's also key bindings with IntelliJ ID and Eclipse. Do you want to run uh, some Kubernetes code? Do you want to run your Java in a Kubernetes um, cluster? So I don't want to start like that. I actually want to create something new. So from the command line, I can just open Visual Studio Code at a specific folder where I am at at the moment. And now what we're going to see is just a simple uh, first Java class. So let's create a folder called the DevOps. Add a new file. And at the moment, you have to say what the extension of the file you want. Because uh, Visual Studio Code is polyglot, you have to tell them, OK, what language is we going to use? So when I, once I'm giving it the extension, the .java extensions, it knows that it's going to create a Java file for me. And here we have installed all those uh, templates that we can just click and run. So here I'm creating a class. And I want to create a main. It also comes part of the, of the Java plugins. And you can see here on the top, there is a run and debug, which basically from here, this, these are my buttons to run and debug the, the application. Let's just say. So this is just kind of an, in the low world of how to use Java uh, in VS Code. And let run it. There you go. So I have it here. On the left side, I have the outline of my project. So it tells me what exists inside. Here at the bottom, I have my dependencies. But I don't have yet dependencies in that project. So we'll see it later on. Let's see how we, how we can debug it. So let's extract that. So I just extracted the string to some local variable just because I want to debug and see how it, how it works. You see on my left side, I have the variables, and I can change it. I also have watch in the call stack just the one we were expecting and where we are at, the function we are at. And I can change it. I can say set value. And 
And here I can continue play. And here we go. That's a little bit of how, how to run and debug, just a simple thing. And also a refactoring that we did. When it can also add this, let's add some variable. So just like in IDE, I have something called source action. And in source action, I can create uh, getters and setters, hash code and equals, two string, all these kind of methods that helps me make uh, write code faster. So here it go, it's created as hash code and equals, oops created outside of my class. Just the way we used to work with ID if we want to make, if we want to, especially if we have uh, a lot of getter setter, getters and setters that we want to create rapidly and we don't want to deal with it. So that was a little bit about how to get started. But now let's look at something more interesting. So this is already a Spring Boot app. This is the pet clinic application Spring Boot app example that exists online if you ever play with it and you know it. And actually what we have here, we also have tests. And all the tests exist here. But what Java gives us with the plugin package is this plugin, the one on the left, that helps us run the tests in a full suit so we can Right click it and run all the testers there. And you can see here at the bottom, it says running tests. Here we go. We got a green V, everything works. This is how the test dashboard looks like. If it was failing, we will see here fail and some exception here at the bottom. So it's pretty intuitive. Um, for most developers, especially if you're just getting started uh, with Java. So that was nice, but I want to Here at the bottom, I have installed something called Spring Boot Dashboard. And I also installed something called Spring Initializers. So I can go to the palette. That's what we call it, the palette. And I can say string initialize. Mm. Oh, it already recommends me a Maven project or a Gradle project. Let's go with Maven. I can pick between Java, Kotlin, and Groovy. Let's do Java at the moment. Give it a name. Pick the boot version, the Spring Boot version that I would like to work with. And here I can pick all the dependencies that I would like to add. So it has a lot of dependency built in and also a lot of dependencies that we can add manually. So it goes all the way from if you're working with uh, Apache Cassandra, if you're working with the cloud and all this uh, other integration, mail senders, all this kind of stuff. But we want to start with the simple web starter.
just removing all the other dependency that I added. There you go. Selected one dependency, press enter to continue. Let's put it here. At workspace, now I can see it in my workspace. Next to the next to the other app I have, this one called demo. And it already started. the Spring application where I can just click and run it. So down in the bottom, I have something called Spring Boot. And in the Spring Boot, I can actually see the application that supports Spring Boot, so I can run it from here. Or if we have the VS Code, the text that we have a Spring Boot app, so we can run it from there. So here I can say start, but now it's going to fail. You'll see why. Oh, no, it's start. Okay, cool. Compiling. Failed. The reason it failed because I didn't compile my code. So I need to go to my Maven project since I created a Maven project. And here I can see it already refreshed everything and I have my Maven, new Maven project here, the demo that I called it. You can press install. And after I install it, then I'll be able to run it from here. Let's try with compile. For some reason, it doesn't want to start. What we can actually do, we can go to the, the plugin itself and run it from here as well. And from here, we can see the arrow of what happens. Some null, okay. Fail to connect and don't port. Yeah, I probably have the other one, you're right. Let's see what we have here running. All right. So PS gives me, PS grep Java gives me um, the Java processes that are running in the background at the moment. And what can I, I can see, I can see, I see the Eclipse JDTLS, that's uh, the server uh, that we talked about in the beginning. And I can see the Pivotal extension because we have a client and a server running from uh, the VS Code to communicate with Java. And we have this one that still runs, so let's do, let's scale this process. Let's check that everything is okay. Yep, and I have only two Java processes running. This is what I expected it to be. So now we can start and now it works. All right, let's close that. So that was a little bit about how to create some code in Java and Visual Studio Code, a little bit of running and debugging, uh, testing, how you can run tests, um, Spring Boot and Spring Initializers. And now, 
let's look at a little bit more sophisticated features that we have here. So we talked about the Spring Initializer, how it helps us to get started if we want to work with uh, Spring Booth or uh, other uh, Springs that we want to work with, uh, uh, with Boot and other dependencies. But the thing is, the most uh, interesting thing here is, uh, is IntelliCode. Intelli what we usually have in IDEs and editors, if we have it in editors at all, uh, a little bit of code completion. So we have code completion in Visual Studio Code, and it's provided by uh, the Java plugin that Red Hat um, uh, working on constantly. And it's powered by some Java development tools, uh, the same Java development tools that are behind Eclipse. Um, so you can expect the same level of support when we're talking about code completion. However, if we add to it a little bit more, we have something called IntelliCode, which is an AI assistant, IntelliSense, that actually uh, uh, has a lot of knowledge and a lot of recommendations that are given to it by uh, the open source projects on GitHub that receive more than 10 hundred, uh, more than 100 stars. So. We have basically machine learning algorithm behind the scenes that it trained on the most common projects on GitHub, and it gives us recommendation online when we're working on our Java code on what, what should be the next thing, how should we um, autocomplete uh, the code set specifically we're working at. So when combined with the con context of the code itself, the completion list is tailored to promote all these practices that we see, all the best practices that we see from uh, some of the best GitHub uh, repositories. Um, it works well with Java libraries, but not only. It's uh, applicable to all languages um, on VS Code that's uh, supported. Uh, it works well with Java SE and String. And it can really help. It doesn't matter if you're developing some monolithic uh, huge web app or uh, you're working on uh, microservices. Because the project on GitHub, this, uh, this is our uh, reference to. Uh, so you know, we have a lot of great projects on GitHubs uh, that receive a lot of stars. So we basically take the insights from there and we bring it back uh, to the developers. And this is a little bit about how it looks like. Um, here's just an example about file system and reading lines from the file system. And it, you, as you can see, it already gives all the recommendations about the equals, about the start with, about uh, the library that you want to work with. So that's great, and that's a great one of the really nice features we have on VS Code for Java developers. But that's not enough. A uh, great feature uh, that we truly, really love is the live share. Because what we're seeing, the world is getting more and more remote. Uh, basically, people today want to work from whatever. They want to work from the train on the way to the office. Uh, they want to work from the office, but they don't want to actually get up and walk all the way to the other colleague to do some code review or to ask questions. Um, they want to work from their house. They want to work from the park. Uh, a lot of people are today kind of uh, um, changing jobs and switching the way they live, specifically in the tech industry, so they can do uh, a more uh, remote work. And actually, this is why we have uh, Live Share, which is the ability to, it gives us the ability to co edit and co debug uh, while sharing audio, servers, terminals, uh, diffs between different files, uh, comments and many, many more. And it doesn't matter if you're creating a code review with your colleagues, or uh, pair programming with some teammates, or you're, even if you're participating in some hackathon, uh, or teaching, or doing some interactive lecture, uh, you can use uh, Live Share, and it, it can support you in many, many ways. And what we're going to see, since my colleagues in the States, it's uh, still 3 a.m. in the morning for them. Uh, we're going to see a short video about how it works. And in the video, it's actually a collaboration between two of my teammates. Uh, they're working on some Node app, 
and uh, they're going to show you how they can uh, do a live share. And actually, they're giving, uh, there's two uh, possible ways uh, to use it. You can, you can do only read access, or you can do read and write access. And here, they're going to do read and write access. And it's also, you can also work with it uh, on Visual Studio itself. So let's start. Here, a Node.js guestbook app that I've been working on. I was looking into a bug that was causing the guestbook to not display any of the profile pictures that the people had signed in. I think I fixed the issue, but before I push this up to my team's repo, I want to have a colleague do a review of my code. So I'm going to use LiveShare to do that review. In VS Code, I can click on the LiveShare icon on the left activity bar to open up the LiveShare viewlet. I can click Start Collaboration Session, and that will start sharing out my code. Additionally, as you can see in the viewlet, I could have joined a session, or I could have started a read-only collaboration session. This is useful if I wanted to share my project without having unnecessary edits made. Or in the case of an interactive lecture, I could share this out with students to follow along. LiveShare supports up to 30 guests joining a session. After the code has been shared, I get a link to the session that I can share out with my colleague. Additionally, you'll notice in the viewlet that there are a couple things that I have already been shared. I have a shared server for the localhost 3000 for the front end as well as a terminal with the node that I did when I started the app. You'll see that there's a listing for audio call and that I could start an audio call. This is because I have the LiveShare audio extension installed. With this extension, I can start up an audio call that is tied to my LiveShare session. With that, any guest joining my session from VS Code and that has the extension installed can join into this call and we can communicate about what we are working on. With the link, let me send it to my teammate, JC, and have him look at my code. So let me message him on Teams. On his side, he'll get the link, and it will open up his browser. From there, it will detect that he has LiveShare installed on his machine and launch Visual Studio. And this will join him into my code. Hey, JC, thanks so much for looking at my code. No problem. Always happy to help. Now that Jonathan is joined into the session, the first thing you'll notice is that on both of our screens, we can see each other's cursors and highlights. So as I highlight and move around the file, he can see it on his editor, and I can see his movements and highlights on my side as well. Additionally, JC is set to follow me. So as I scroll through the file or change files, his editor follows along with me. So in this file, let me show you, I made this change over here to make the title a little bit clearer. All right, that change looks good, but I'm curious to see the set of changes that you've made within this review and other files. So if I switch to the Team Explorer team tool window, I can see that you've made some changes as well as uh, in header.js, also in signature matrix, JS, and guestbook grid. So let me click signature matrix, and I want to see a diff view to know exactly what you've changed in this file. And so once I enable the diff view, I can see that, oh, okay, you've changed unshift to shift. And I'm curious, John, why it is you made that change? So yeah, so while I was looking into this issue, I found that unshift wasn't actually returning the right things that I needed for the matrix. So when, upon changing it to shift, it looks like it fixed the issue. OK, I guess that makes sense. Now, in addition to being able to see the set of changed files that John has made, I can also leverage all of the language services I would come to expect from Visual Studio, even though I'm looking at his remote code. So for example, if I wanted to see the definition of the signatures variable at, in general, I could simply right click and say peak definition to verify that, OK, this is in fact the set of signature data that the application is running against. And therefore, this change to shift uh, makes sense to me. Now, I'm also able to go and look at other files independent of John. So even though I'm able to follow him, as we showed earlier, I can also look and explore ideas on my own. So I'm going to go to guestbookgrid.js, and I'll toggle off the diff view because I'm curious to take a look at this with a little bit more screen real estate. And in addition to the navigation capabilities that I get from his um, remote language services, I also get all of the linting errors and diagnostic information as well. So I can immediately see that this line has an error with it. And if I hover over, I can determine that it's because it's using a var when our application is configured to use the letter const. Now beyond error information and navigation, I as a guest in a live share session can also make edits collaboratively. So I'm going to just change this var const. And as soon as I start typing, I get the completion list once again, as I would expect when editing locally in Visual Studio, even though I'm able to work with John and he can see these changes as well. 
So at this point, John and I are in different files. And if I want to pull his attention to see the change I just made, I can perform a focus operation, which will send a request to him to come and join me in this file so that we can take a look at this change together. On my end, I get a request for that. So I can click Follow. And that will jump me to JC's location. And I can see what he's been talking about and see what he's been working on. All right, John. So I think the changes that you've made look good. And I just fixed the lingering error that you had. But I'm curious to do a little bit of debugging and just make sure that functionally the app still works correctly. Sure. Let's try debugging this app. All right. So I think what I want to do is go to signaturematrix.js and actually run this specific algorithm to make sure everything is good. So I'm going to set a breakpoint on line 7 and then also line 19. Can we go ahead and run this? Yeah. So as a guest, how about you try running it and starting debugging session? OK. So I think we're going to go ahead and launch this uh, using Chrome, which because you're on a Mac, that's the browser that you're using. And so even though this app and this code is not local to my machine here on Windows, I can simply press the Play button to launch the app and the debugger into a new session. So now that we're in a debugging session, I see that the breakpoints that JC has. All right. So basically, they continue going on. And at the end, they're sharing uh, the servers, where uh, JC is able to open as a uh, Chrome and actually uh, write localhost and open uh, the servers that is uh, running on, um, on John's uh, Mac, which is uh, pretty interesting and uh, cool tool uh, if you're doing remote or if you're doing um, uh, consulting, or if you're doing a lot of this kind of work, uh, it's a great uh, tool to use. So that's not the only one, the only thing. Uh, we have uh, one last thing that I would like to talk about, and this is how we work as developers. So most of the time, we have a lot of different environments. We have the dev environment, we have the test environment, we have most of the time we have staging and some production. In the middle, we have some DevOps tool that helps us uh, compile our code, run our tests, create the release that we want. Uh, but we always kind of lack the ability to test our code uh, in the environment in a fast, uh, reliable, uh, and a way that we can actually reproduce all the bugs that we see sometimes in production or in staging uh, that we don't understand why uh, that happens. So common phrase, it worked on my machine, but now it breaks production. Uh, so this is why we introduced this uh, great tool who, uh, who's uh, called remote, remote Development. And at the moment, it's, uh, it has uh, two features. Uh, one is uh, SSS, SSH. Basically, you can create an SSH tunnel and between your VS Code machine and the machine where you want your code to run uh, and run it there from your VS Code. So you can run your tests. You can uh, change the code. You can do whatever you want from your VS Code. And the second one, which I'm um, super excited about, is the container. Basically, uh, you run your VS Code inside a container that can exist on the cloud, that can exist somewhere in a different environment that uh, mimics, uh, in a good way, your production environment or your staging environment. And you can, and you can actually re reproduce um, any bugs or anything that you have, because you uh, make sure that, you, that you're going to have the same environment as the one you have. Um, on production. And also a great value of that, that if you have a new team member coming into the team, they don't need to set up all the environment. They don't need to set up um, all uh, the dev environment usually uh, people do about setting the VM, setting all this kind of stuff. If you have containers, you just provide them with one container and he can run his code uh, there. And then you know that it's going to be uh, um, it's going to be the same environment that you expected where it should be run. Uh, and also, you can quickly sweep between environments. Um, you can say, I want my specific Linux, or I want my specific Windows machine now to run. So you can switch easily between environments, and you can do it all from VS Code. And you can run your test there, and your test will run on the container. So that's also a plugin for Docker. So you can, uh, you can create an image and everything you want from Docker. So we have a few minutes. Let's see how it looks like. 
So here on the left, I have my Docker, which is also a plugin, and I can create images, and I can run, start running containers. So if I'm going back to my code, I can see in my demo code, I, didn't, I don't have any, uh, any Docker here. So I can say, and Docker files to workspace. It's actually going to generate a file for me. So I don't need to think about it much. Ask me what language do I want to use. I'm going to pick Java. What ports? Yes. And here I notice there is this comment saying that if I'm running Spring Boot, I should use this entry point instead of the one it generates. So here, inside my project, I got my Docker file now. Giving it a name to the image itself. All right. So now here I have my demo. This is number one. Right click on it. I can run it from here. Of course, you have to make sure you have your Docker running in the background. And for my containers, I have my container running there. And if I have some VM, some remote VM, I can also uh, deploy it there, start running it from there. Here on the bottom, I have this uh, green thing. It asks me, what do I want to do? Do I want to do some remote SSH? Do I want to do some remote uh, containers? Let's do open folder in a container. It's probably going to fail because I have some uh, Mac privacy. I need to Let's give it a try. Right here, conferences, demo. Ask me where do I want to run it from, from a Docker file, because I have my Docker file there. Yes. You see on the left it says opening remote. Yeah, it fails. It was expected to fail because I have some Mac privacy issues here. But this is how it works. And actually, after that, we can run all our, all our tests in the container itself, or we can connect it to a container that uh, exists remotely. Right. So here's all the resources for you if you want to get started uh, with Visual Studio and Java, if you want to learn more about the remote dev, uh, you want to learn more about the live sharing, uh, which is a great feature, uh, IntelliCode, uh, how it built behind the scenes. It's all open source, so you can go in and see how they build the, if you're interested in how they build the machine learning, uh, how they are doing everything uh, behind the scene. And also, we have uh, Microsoft Learn, where there's uh, courses for free for you to try out uh, and see uh, all the great features around uh, VS Code and the cloud. So what we would like to get back from you uh, is a little bit of feedback. Uh, after you try VS Code, we would like to know what you think about it. Uh, was it in, uh, intuitive for you? Uh, what are the more functions that you want to see there? Um, do you want to see some Android support? Or there's some uh, build tool that you want to see that doesn't exist, except for Maven and Gradle? Uh, some more uh, framework support that you want to see? Um, 
the team is pretty open-minded and really would like to get any feedback uh, back, from, uh, back from you to make the tool even better. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, Visual Studio Code is open source. There's no plans to make it any other things. Microsoft has Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio uh, Code is for the community, by the community, supported by the community. Everything is uh, online and available. It's not going to be an IDE. That's, that's not going to happen. It's going to stay lightweight, uh, set your own environment, put the plugins that you want. That's it. I'm doing distributed systems, so I'm using a lot of Apache Spark and uh, Scala, so it's, I'm not doing that on a daily basis, but sometimes when I do need some Java web app to make something quick, I'm also organizing some conferences, so sometimes I need a website, I need all this kind of stuff. It's super fast. Um, it definitely makes my life easier because I don't need to configure a lot of things. Um, yeah, it's 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 great to uh, uh, to start project and get it you know running and all the configuration with everything you need like in the Docker if you need a Docker file it's a press of a button you configure the Docker the Docker uh, image so super uh, super um, super comfortable. Well, IntelliJ has so many different features in plugin, and IntelliJ is a full IDE. I don't see it, I, I personally don't see it in the future replacing uh, IntelliJ, because it's different. It's just built different. There's uh, thousands of, of people that worked on IntelliJ. Here it's by the community. There's a few you know, people in Microsoft that working on it, but it's not the product that, you know, it's not for generating uh, revenue for Microsoft. It's actually for the community, something that Microsoft donates uh, back. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think they're going to stick with lightweight, easy, uh, fast projects, fast development. Yeah. Thank you.